I work in a specialty that never sleeps. I'm an emergency physician. From my accent, you must have realized I am from somewhere, but not here. <laughs> so let me make it easy for you. Namaste. <laughs> I am from India. I graduated as a medical doctor in India 25 years ago. I come from a town called Basin in India. And here I am in beautiful Bradenton speaking to you about access. Access in healthcare has gained immense importance more since the world has changed so much in the last three years. As we all strive to come out of the dark era of COVID, we now live in a changed world. COVID is here to stay. And we not only want to survive, but also thrive despite it. By virtue of being a physician, I am an optimist. To believe that you're safe is more comforting than to realize what you believe is untrue. <laughs> COVID made me realize the latter. COVID was the largest challenge to health security, both locally and globally. This COVID was novel. When this novel virus arrived, it arrived with its novelty. It spread fast. It needed a test to diagnose it. It needed medications to treat it. And it needed a vaccine to prevent it. A perfect textbook biological outbreak. COVID continued to create a havoc, hitting humans, pushing humanity to the brink and overwhelming the need for humanitarian assistance worldwide. Crowded emergency departments dominated the global landscape of health systems. Patients infected with COVID, patients who were worried that they had COVID, rushed to the emergency departments, which were already crowded, taking care of patients of heart attack, stroke, and trauma. COVID was a disaster. If this challenge was not enough, there was another huge challenge. And that was the challenge of access to credible information. COVID produced new information every day and continues to do that even today. Let's take an example of masks. Do we use one mask? Do we double mask? Do we only use it indoors? Do we use it outdoors? Now we are using it on the plane. Now we are not using it on the plane. Information was evolving and the people had to wade through this evolving information. As people had their own set of challenges, we the physicians had a completely new set of challenges. How are we going to take care of the crowded emergency departments? How are we going to segregate the critical COVID patients from these crowds? How are we going to efficiently use the oxygen? How are we going to effectively use the ventilators? How are we going to safely discharge these patients home so that we could make beds available for more patients? There was so much information and so many interpretations that it became both immediate and important that credible information be accessed and deciphered appropriately. Access to credible information became a critical global need. In the past 25 years, I have had a career focused on international medicine. 
I was trained in India and I'm treating patients in the United States. Both are nations with multiple cultures. Hence, I consider myself as a global physician. Being trained in emergency medicine and public health, I have interacted with physicians, scientists, medical students, nurses, and policymakers across the world to advance the science of patient care. This included spearheading the development of academic emergency medicine in India and founding the American College of Academic International Medicine. Hence, when COVID hit the world and access to credible information became a critical global necessity, I had to do something. I reached out to my colleagues across the world. I wanted to know what they were doing to combat this pandemic. Everybody was trying hard. Different countries, different cultures, same virus. This was unique and something dawned on me. COVID was affecting everyone everywhere. Hence, we could learn from everyone and from everywhere. Lessons of success and lessons of failure were equally important. What worked, what did not work, was vital information when every bit of information was critical. It would be so productive if we all met and learned by sharing. I decided I'm going to have a meeting. I'm going to have a Zoom meeting. <laughs> so I started inviting all my colleagues. Now, when it comes to invitations, different cultures respond differently to invitations. <laughs> Some cultures respond very well to emails. Some require you to send an email and a chat message. <laughs> Some require you to send an email, a chat message, and a personal phone call, please come. <laughs> and some want you to repeat that process as a reminder. <laughs> so we got through all that. And finally, everybody decided Saturday is the day. 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time suited our farthest member from Osaka, Japan. And then we met. What a meeting. Everybody wanted to speak. Everybody wanted to share. Everybody wanted to express. Everybody wanted to interact. There was so much enthusiasm that I had to police it so that everybody could share their enthusiasm. A one hour meeting went on for two hours. And then we decided we'll meet the next Saturday again. And we met. And then we met another Saturday. We were discussing cases. We were debating doctrines. We are trying to find solutions. There was so much knowledge being created that I suggested to the group, why don't we build some common processes for managing patients based on the experiences we are having across the world? This will help us manage patients. And everybody said, let's do it. OK, let's do it. Who's going to do it? <laughs> everybody was busy. So I came up with a strategy. I said, I'm going to use all the enthusiasm available, and I'm going to engage everybody. So the strategy was called drafting and crafting. So I had two sets of experts who attended my meetings. One were the senior faculty, senior researchers, years of experience, full of opinions. And then we had the junior faculty, the junior researchers, enthusiastic, committed, wanted to engage. So the younger crowd became the drafters, and the senior experts became the crafters. 
the first chance to produce the draft went to the drafters. So they worked hard and they produced the first draft. And it got torn by the crafters. <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? This is not the right way. They had the opinions and they wanted modified and they wanted research more put in and this and that and it went on. So we gave them Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday to give their opinions, even review the video recording of the meeting, give modifications, give critical feedback so that the drafters could work on Thursday and Friday to produce a modified draft, updated draft with everybody's opinions, respecting everybody's experiences. And then the cycle repeated. So the drafters and the crafters worked together. And in a few weeks, we had our first process written out. Everybody was happy. What do we do with it? It's written out. What next? I said, let's get it published. Let's publish it in a scientific journal. And the drafters and the crafter got more excited. <laughs> so see their name in a journal? Let's do it. So they again got curating the article, finishing it, putting it references, getting it well decorated, and we had our first publication. And another, and another. And 25 publications later, we can say that we not only published in shock, but also made it to the front cover. We had achieved something unique. Our small Saturday meeting had grown to be a global COVID summit. We had debated, we had discussed, we had interacted, we had shared. In crisis, we delivered collaborative creativity. We were inclusive of everyone's expertise, experiences, and opinions. Our experts came from diverse cultures. We produced publications which were equitable and could be used by physicians in Sarasota, Bradenton, and around the world. Because we published these articles in open access journals, which was available to everyone across the world online 24 by 7. Collaborative creativity was an achievement in crisis. This global pandemic required local responses, but demanded global cooperation. In my case, our collaborations helped me solve local challenges by learning from each other and sharing it with all others. COVID taught us one thing. Breaking barriers and building networks is pivotal to bridging the gaps. Collaboration with experts around the world is crucial to advance patient care. And patient care is always local. We all are aware that collaborations exist at a global level to maintain peace and security. This is more applicable to health now more than ever. Collaborative creativity is good for security. It is better for sustainability, and it is the best for patient care. Connect globally, but care locally. Access to collaborations globally is key to achieving successes locally. I would like to end by saying, to me, the word access, A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, means advancing collaborative creativity for enhancing sustainable security. <laughs>